here today, JV uh, from the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, she received uh, her PhD from Hawaii State University, uh, where she worked uh, with uh, Steve McKeever. Uh, I then met her at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, where she did a postdoc uh, uh, with Peter Mueller, so in a sense, uh, academic cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and um, now she's uh, in Santa Cruz, uh, where she's uh, in Venezuela, She's going to talk about optimizing natural killer cell to exist for the homogeneous cancer patient based on multiple event times. <laughs> for your invitation. It's my great, uh, great, uh, great pleasure to visit your department. I'm a little bit you know, like <laughs> going down because I got up so early this morning. <laughs> and so <laughs> if I did something stupid, like that's not me, like it's uh, okay, like, that's not usual here. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so let me start. So today I'm going to talk about sequential adaptive Bayesian design to uh, optimize and evaluate natural killer cell process for heterogeneous cancer patients based on multiple event outcomes. And this is a joint work with Peter Thor in Biostatistics at MD Anderson Cancer Center and Katie Rizvani in Stem Cell Transplantation and Cellular Therapy at MD Anderson Cancer Center as well. She runs a lot of clinical trials. It is motivated by one of his, uh, her the trials. And so let me let me talk about like the what I have for the title. So here are the natural killer cells. And it is a subset of a lymphocyte. It's uh, related to the immune system. A type of cells related to the immune system. And it can be used for the cancer immunotherapy. So I will talk about what Im immunotherapy is a little bit uh, soon. And so like uh, she wanted to evaluate uh, the natural killer cells for the treatment. And so that was the whole the motivation. And then we did uh, a sequentially adaptive Bayesian design. And so like it is making a decision like based on uh, I mean, as more data comes in the, during the trial, and at the end of the trial, we make another decision, and I will talk about what those decisions are uh, the later as well. And then we have a heterogeneous cancer patient, so we do not assume the patients coming into the trial are homogeneous. They are different. Okay, so they are different by prognostic factors that we already know, and so they belong to the different subgroups defined by prognostic factors. And then based on the previous studies, we know optimal the cancer cell doses may be different for the different subtypes. Okay, so that's what we do. And then, the, so a patient comes into a trial, and then we give a treatment, and then we follow, we monitor the patient, right? And then we observe the clinical outcomes. And here we have multiple, uh, multiple outcomes. In fact, we have five outcomes. I will talk about that later as well. OK, so briefly, let me talk about the trial background. It's uh, a lot of uh, medical terminology, which I do not pronounce it properly, but uh, I will do my best. So the NK cells. So we use NK cells to treat uh, the severe hematologic malignancies, including leukemia or myeloma or uh, multiple uh, I mean, like leukemia. What is that? Yes, the multiple myeloma and then cold blood cancer. Okay, so that is it. Uh, okay, let me move forward. So for the patient who relapsed frontline therapy, so like it's a bad, right? So the first treatment didn't work well, and then the clinicians give a salvage therapy to rescue them, okay? So a standard salvage therapy is a allogeneic, a stem cell transplantation, and it's good, but like unfortunately, even for patients in the second complete remission, so set, uh, complete remission means like you do not observe any cancer cells after treatment, okay? So or even though you do not see like any cancer cells and then you say like it, get, it gets cured, 
But however, there are two years of survival is roughly 25%, which is so sad, right? So as an alternative, so it's a new therapy and it's a promising, so adaptive cell therapy, and which is called immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is a treatment to, uh, that, uses, uh, that uses patients' own immune system. Okay, so one of like, the recently approved immunotherapy is this chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy. So how it works is like, we remove T-cells from patient's blood. Okay, and then we alter genetically the removed remove uh, remove uh, T-cells in a lab by adding a uh, specific uh, chimeric antigen receptor. Okay? And then the we give those altered um, T cells back to the patient so that the T cells accurately target the cancer cells. Okay, so that is how it works. Okay, so it is promising, it works fine, and then it gives us durable clinical results. And however, it is associated with acute toxi uh, toxicity outcomes, such as uh, like a cytokine release syndrome, that is a side effect which are very uh, severe and fatal. Okay? So instead of a T cell, maybe we can use different cells. So that is NK cells. Okay, so the NK cell, I mean, like it, it's, uh, it has been emerged as a powerful treatment modality for advanced cancer. Okay, so that is N NK cells. And then there are the different sources to get NK cells. And so one is like most of the groups to use autologous uh, uh, or the adult peripheral uh, the donor drive NK cells. And uh, my collaborator, Katie Rizbani, identified umbilical cord as a source for the NK cells. So she wants to evaluate uh, the NK cell to treat the severe hematology malignancies. And so like that's the whole background of our design. Okay, so okay. hopefully I didn't, I didn't lose you there. And so, okay, so a little bit more specific about our, uh, our trial setting. So I said we have heterogeneous groups, right? So there are to identify the important prognostic factors, disease type and the disease work. And then this is, for disease type, we have three different disease types, CLL, ALL, and HL. And for disease work, we have low, di low bulk disease and high bulk disease. High bulk disease is known to be associated with uh, like a high chance of a side effect. A bad effect. Okay, and so that is uh, about it. So here we have uh, six different types and then uh, two different types. So um, three different types and two different types, six. Right. So in total, we have uh, six different prognostic subgroups defined by these two. Okay. So the, our. Uh -huh. What do you mean by uh, what does uh, this is both mean? Well, I'll define as <laughs> okay, that is something beyond me. I'm sorry, I cannot, but like, I, I mean, yeah, so uh, I think that, that is a different disease status. Yes, so like, it's like, um, I think that the high bulk disease, as far as I know, like, it is more advanced than like a new bulk. Sorry, not sufficient answer. <laughs> It makes, it, makes it makes more sense now, yes. but like, so like based on the uh, the Katie uh, Katie's input, like collaborators input, like we think we have a different optimal doses for the uh, this six prognostic subgroups, and that's uh, that is it. So like we want to identify the optimal NK cell for uh, those for the each subgroup, so which could be called. Precision medicine or personalized medicine. Any questions? Mm -hmm. so, so these six, uh, so you're considering them as separate entities. You don't have any structure because you have LBD, ALL, and LBD, CLL. So this is a structure here, right? Just considering there are six different possibilities, you move that structure. 
Yes, that is a, uh, yes, I, you are right. So like here, these three types of mean, we, so like for the disease bulk, and then we know like a high bulk is more advanced. So there is something, it's ordinary thing. And however, for these three, we do not know, yes. And then, and then uh, I, I will talk about some challenges that I have uh, for uh, regarding this trial. And, uh, and then I will get to something similar like a later. Yes. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on. So like a clinical outcomes. We monitor some outcomes after giving a treatment, right? So the, usually the toxicity outcome only in phase one. So that is the first trial on human. And in phase one, two, we have one good outcome, efficacy, and then toxicity, so bad outcome, like the two outcomes usually. And however, like it, I mean, in our case, we have five different outcomes, which is good and bad. And the good means like we have five outcomes coming from one patient, right? So we get a more comprehensive evaluation of uh, the treatment, right? And at the same time, it makes the model more complicated, right? So it's good and bad. And so we have time to death, and then we have, so that is a fatal out outcome, right? So once die, let's die, right? And, okay. <laughs> oh, I get it. So, sorry. It's not like that easy word, but okay. <coughs> And so I have uh, four non-fatal outcomes, they are still alive, right? So disease progression, response, which is good, severe toxicity, but severe, uh, severe cytokine release syndrome, so called this, uh, cytokine storm. And this, this one is a, is a typical side effect of uh, immunotherapy. And so like, we have these four non-fatal outcomes. And then for the each patient, we follow up like for one year. So we monitor these three outcomes for one year. And then toxicity and cytokine, uh, cytokine stone, like that one, we know like they occur most likely after the cell infusion, giving a treatment. So we monitor them for 100 days only. Okay. And then one, so the patient, Y sub J, so it's a time to event. So we have these five outcomes, and then they are independently censored at the end of the follow-up period, right? And then we have informative censoring by death, right? So death, that is a fatal outcome that can informally censor non-fatal outcomes. And but like not the other round, right? So it is a semi-competing risk. Mm -hmm. And then the, from KD, we know like the uh, progressive disease and response, they are competing risks. So which means we, uh, we either observe one of them or none. That means both cannot occur. Okay, so that is it. Then we move on. So our clinical uh, experience, we know like these YJs are interdependent. It's easy to imagine because they come from the same patient. Right, so they are dependent, and then the, the joint distribution of Y varies between the subgroups, right? So it's gonna be different uh, by subgroups and by dose as well, right? So we have uh, three different doses, and then it will be different by dose as well. Okay, so so like if we are following up patient for a year. So usually how it works is if your clinical outcome is right after, I mean, it's something that you can get right after treatment, then like you wait until everyone gets evaluated. And however, like we have to wait for a year, which means if you wait till like everyone gets follow up, then like a trial will, um, trial will run very slowly. It would take forever, all right? So what we do is like, we, we do not wait. We do not suspend uh, the approval to wait for the full evaluation. And instead of that, we are using the time to event. So like it's a time to event, like that is a, I mean, like a, nothing new, like it has been used. 
So like uh, one of the earlier works is time to invent the CRM. So that is one of the earlier works. And then here's our more recent works. And, but like it is uh, like one continuous uh, outcome and or the two continuous outcome or the two, but like we have a five. Okay, so here's the recording the event time. So the patient enters in a sequence into the trial, right? So each of them, like we follow them up. And let's say like this is the, uh, the end. So it's uh, either the occurrence time or they are censored. And like if it is a non-fatal outcome, then it can be censored by, uh, I mean, like, uh, it can be censored administratively or by death. And then that's the end. And then at any prior time, and we have observed the value. So this one is occurrence time or the sensor. And then here, that any time, like you have observed the value, y superscript O. And then with this delta, delta is a binary indicator, the censoring. So if it is occurred, then it gets one. And if it is censored, then like the, it gets a zero. Okay, so you have a two two outcomes, one is the, the time, and then the indicator of whether it is a really a current time or a censoring time. Okay, so recall, like our goal is to develop a clinical trial design that does subgroup specific safety monitoring and the dose selection. So before getting into more details, let me, uh, let me explain how a trial works at Grunt. So trial begins, right? So and we know, I mean, usually we specify that the maximum number of patients we will get in a trial in advance, right? And then that's, uh, and the patient comes in, right? And then like, then we follow them up, which means we are accumulating more data. We are gathering more data, right? And then as we get more data, and we can make some decisions. So like whether a dose is unsafe. If dose is unsafe, then we remove those unsafe doses from treatment, right? And then at the end of a, a trial, we collect all the data, and then we make another decision, like whether a dose is safe or not, and then also which dose is best, all right? So that is it. Okay, so let me get into the details here. So safety monitoring, so we determine whether a dose is safe or not during the trial and at the end of the trial. And then dose selection, we select the best dose at the end of the trial. Okay, so, so here like I already informed that the subgroup, uh, the prognostic subgroups are important to determine which dose is important, uh, which dose is best. So Ignoring subgroups uh, that leads to high probability of making incorrect decisions, like suboptimal decisions, right? And so, like here's one example here. So, one big challenge in the in a clinical trial is we do not have a, that big sample size. Like people think about, I mean, people talk about like millions of observations, but we are talking about 60 patients in a trial. And so, like here, let's see, we have these six subgroups, so like low bulk disease, high bulk disease, NICNL, ALL, NHL. So we have six, so we are informed that like LBD occurs with a probability one third, and then HBD occurs with a probability, with, uh, I mean, remaining probability two thirds. So on average, for subgroups having LBD, we have only seven patients. And furthermore, these seven, seven patients were, are disputed over different doses. Right? So it's like two patients per dose, uh, per dose within a subgroup. Okay, so it makes it uh, hard to make reliable decisions. Right? So it gets very, very critical that we build a hierarchical model so that we can allow, we can borrow information across subgroups and across doses, across different outcomes, so that we can enhance our decision-making procedure. Okay, so that's, uh, that's about it. And then, let me see, let me think if I'm skipping anything. Okay, so we're good. 
And then the another thing is like for the side uh, of the uh, I mean, different from the other drugs, uh, I mean, like for the immunotherapy, it's uh, like a monotonicity assumption is not valid. And so, like, there's no, like, the clinical outcomes relationship between the clinical outcomes and the doses may, may not be monotone. So, like, we need to take care of uh, some interaction effects as well. So, like, and so, like, it's uh, really hard. And so, like, after finishing the trial, we have 60 observations. And then in the beginning of a trial, we have three, I mean, if the court size is three, three observations, and six observations, and nine observations. So in the beginning, like the information is data is more sparse. And so the sampling model, so let me talk, uh-huh. Can I just ask you a quick question about the monotonicity? I mean, you, you assume that you have monotonicity in some outcomes, right? I mean, in other words, you're looking at something like death, if you under treat you're going to have higher risk as you over treat, you're going to have higher risk and you're going to have kind of a bottom out quadratic effect. But if you got something like a DLT, then it's kind of safe to assume that that's going to be monotonic even in a natural pill or so setting, right? Where you've got a dose limiting toxicity that's going to be coming on. Uh, you mean, like, uh, okay. So I, I do not know well about like this, uh, like the biology, but like based on the, our conversation with the Katie, and uh, we were told that like uh, the assuming the monotonicity is uh, not realistic, and so that's why like we accounted for like non-monotone uh, the relationships. And but maybe like you are right, and but like it, it not but like maybe not for this uh, particular example. Yeah, I mean I can see it on some things, but again, if you take something like cytokine release syndrome. Uh huh. That's going to be monotonic in the amount of natural killer cell immunotherapy that you're actually giving to people. Oh, okay. People don't just naturally develop cytokine kind of release syndrome. You know, it's going to be induced. So, uh, that would be yeah, monotonic, then, right? I, I think you, you you are right with the high chance. Yeah. And, yeah, but like, I mean, that is a, slightly different from what I heard from Katie. So like, we didn't. So that's why we didn't assume the monotonicity. Do you think even the time until onset? Because you, what, 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 it depends how you measure the syndrome as a phenotype. Yeah, but if you're thinking about kind of a relative risk, and I would imagine something like proportional hazard setting, even that is going to be monotonic on something on, on specific outcomes. I, again, I can imagine non monotonicity on other outcomes, right? So like progression versus relapse, or I'm sorry, uh, progression versus uh, response. Then I can see non monotonicity in uh, death as well. But Anyways, I'll, I'll yeah, let you so, Again, yes, I think it can, I, it can differ depending upon your five outcomes. Uh, yeah, and there are also like a, if you prepare for like a more complicated relationship, I mean, if your model works for more complicated uh, the relationships, then like it may work well for more tone relationships as well. And that's what I hope, but maybe like if, uh, if it, I mean, I have uh, some comments in the end, but like if you can assume some monotonous state, then like you can save some, you can reduce some parameters, <coughs> number of parameters, which is better in the, you know, triage, right? So, I mean, like definitely if it is known, then like it's better, uh, better to incorporate it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so let me uh, let me talk about the sampling model, and uh, and then I will get to the trial uh, conduct later. Okay, so here we have a, like this Z in bold, and that's a, that's a um, subgroup of like the co of co uh, prognostic factors of a patient's eye. So literally, uh, this Z not in bold. That is a bulk. This is a bulk, so low bulk or high bulk, zero, one. And then R, that is disease type, we have one, two, three. And so we have a six prognostic uh, the subgroups in the end. So we have here D, that dose that is a one, two, three. So we have a three different doses. And we didn't do like anything like a very complicated. And we did, uh, we make it uh, simple. So we use the Y-B model. And with the scale parameter alpha j, and then we have uh, uh, some like a scale parameter, the e to d lambda i j. And then we're gonna connect the prognostic vectors and this do, uh, this, uh, 
In case of those is two, this is lambda, using some simple linear regression. And so the wider distribution, like the, I mean, it, it allows three different shapes for the hazard. So it doesn't like to do a very elaborate things, but it may be do okay. Uh, so like it's uh, either increasing or constant, decreasing depending on your alpha value. And then here's the hazard and the survival of uh, the function. And then here, because of uh, semi-competing and those things, we have this Y sub D, so that is a support for that. Um, and then the here, the because of a competing risk structure, I mean, like, I mean, each of them is not actually hazard. To be precise, it is like it's cause specific sub hazard functions. And then, in fact, some of them is a hazard for the either one of them, right? But like for convenience, we call them hazard here. And then, the, like from the previous works, we know like the uh, I mean like hazard functions all uh, all outcomes like they are like it can be estimated. And it's a little bit the theory uh, about the estimability. And then here, so my regression part. So I have a z, right? So that uh, no, I have a lambda here. So that is a log of a scale parameter. And then that is related in this way. So it's not like again elaborate model, but maybe okay to account for the covariate effects, prognostic effects, and the those effects. First, this U, that is a random frailty to allow some heterogeneity between patients within a group. And then here, the beta, that is the effect of disease bulk. And so the beta sub J. And then the here, this to C, if I pronounce that letter correctly, no grip here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. so to C, so that is a indexed by R and B. So like it accounts for some interactions between uh, the disease type and dose. And the, then CD, like that is uh, mean like it's set to be one. And so like this is actually the effect of dose on the death, uh, death rate for the disease type R. So it, I mean this one will uh, explain the relationship between the doses and the disease types on death. And then this is C sub J, so that is uh, uh, adjustment for the, the other outcomes. So like uh, this one is uh, like uh, connecting, like uh, combining the different outcomes as well. And so this beta J, so like uh, that's the additive effect on the log of a hazard, and then this one is a latent frame. Okay, so this one is very simple, maybe overly simplified, but as I said earlier, it's very challenging to have a, a, an elaborate model, and maybe, and then also, one of the uh, the primary goals in clinical trial is uh, is to make um, I mean decisions with a high, I mean good decisions with a high probability. Our goal is not to uh, estimate the the response, I mean, those and the cool, uh, like response surfaces accurately. It's not our primary goal, right? It's uh, uh, almost impossible to estimate this response curve accurately based on three observations or six observations and so on. So we better focus on simpler model and which, which can give us reliable decisions. And that's the goal. Okay, so here, like we are using the 18 parameters. If we allow like a certain interaction, uh, then like it becomes like 90, uh, 19 parameters. So it is a parsimonious, and so like it's a, it may work fine, and then it is still flexible because I mean this non monotonicity is implemented here. And then here the frailty model, so u sub i, I mean like given you the random frailties, five outcomes are independent, although they come from the same patient. And however, this u sub i, so that is a random frailty from this uh, multivariate normal distribution, 
with this non-identity uh, covariance matrix. So after integrate uh, 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 after integrating out this U, then those five outcomes become inter interdependent. And so this one like induces some correlations between the outcomes, and then also it accounts for some extra heterogeneity between patients beyond these prognostic subgroups. In the French model, I mean, like it's very common uh, for the multivariate failure time data in like competing risk setting or semi-competing risk setting. Okay, so I think I need to hurry up a little bit. So the usual priors, so like I have a gamma and the normal and the normal, and then I use the sum like the prior information, it should be positive, so I have a truncated normal distribution. And so here's uh, another thing. So like uh, in the beginning of a trial, so we are Bayesian, so we can use uh, we can use some prior information with uh, to uh, we can use uh, we can uh, calibrate our prior to reflect uh, some prior information, which is really really crucial in a in a trial because you know again like an absolute number of patients is small, right? So we better. Uh, it's much better to start with a good starting point, right? So that's it. So let's see here. This one, these are the, uh, this is table provided by the Katie. So like it's all probabilities. So we have these six prognostic subgroups and these are the probabilities of occurrence by the end of follow period. And we use these probabilities to set up I mean, to elicit like the values for the fixed hyperparameters, and uh, that's uh, and then so like that's what we did, and then also we we set the dispersion parameters to be large enough so that like the how do I say like the, the posterior distribution does not insist where the prior is. Okay, so whenever there is some conflict between the observed data and the prior, then the posterior will move quickly toward where the data indicates. Okay, so that's uh, our motivation of having some okay. uh -huh. Just kind of on that point, then. So you showed us kind of the sample size, which is 60 across everybody, 7 and 13. How many? For example, cytokine release syndrome events do you expect to see in the 60 patients over 100 days? So, like, if uh, uh, that, ah, okay, so cytokine storm is, uh, is, uh, is not here, but like it was provided as an additional information. I do not remember exactly the, uh, the, uh, the probability, but like there was, uh, sorry, like I, but like it, the, uh, so Katie gave us a probability. We used it to set up the prior, and but I sorry I do not remember the exact value. But I can give you later after. I guess the reason I'm asking is because I mean even at, you know a very high rate would probably be something like maybe twenty percent that you might see, which would be twelve total, and then stratified across your six subgroups, maybe one to two events potentially. And so how, how vague can we really be with priors when we're trying to, I mean, that's where your information is coming from, right, and kind of in. So I guess I'm just curious as to how non-informative can we really be if we're talking about one to two events and we're trying to model the time to an event in, in a particular subpopulation. Yes, that is correct. But uh, if, uh, I mean, like, a, I mean, as I explained in the model, so, model, so like, outcomes are interrelated, and then the subgroups are interrelated, so they are combined under this hierarchical model. So, like even though like you may observe just one outcome per like a subgroup, but it, this outcome means I mean also mean a lot to the other things. And so, I mean hopefully, I mean like even with that one, like it's but inevitable. Like any model should make a decision based on those outcomes. Right, and then, so they could, I mean. Well, I, I guess, the, I, I, I mean, the question is, are you making a decision based upon your prior? Or are uh, you making a decision based I upon mean, but like we, we did some simulation studies, which is a very different from like our priors, and, and it works, I mean, like not perfect, but it works fine. And so, 
Emil. Emil, it's a, I mean, I would say it's a better than nothing. <laughs> so our design does something as we want to, I mean, which what we, which we want to do. And so we have a, at least a tool. And yeah. Any other questions? Uh -huh. So yes, I mean, uh, you seem nice. So on hand, so yeah, I mean, uh, the confidence is in private. Probably have some uh, sensitivity. Yes. Yes, we tried. I uh, mean, like uh, we, uh, because of, like uh, we we tried uh, this. Uh, we ran the trials under different simulation scenarios, and then try. I uh, mean, like uh, to examine how our design works in a different settings, even when like it's it's different from like a prior. Uh, assume like any uh, I mean the structure underlying structure between the disease types and but like here in the clearly we are using the, the something like additive effect and so like we are saying like this beta is positive then like it is a higher uh, uh, it's a higher hazard for the high level disease so like it, there is a, some structure but this is I mean, like it made it a bit too simple but like this one like it doesn't use any other questions? Okay. So that's that is it. so like here, the usual things, right? So at any trial time t, we have interim data and the fixed parameters, right? So fixed hyperparameters, we combine with the true and posterior distribution. Bubble is simple enough, right? So that like we can use the usual the MCMC skills that you learned from your class to get the posterior samples of the data, the random parameters, and the random frailties. And then we use these posterior samples to, to implement the safety monitoring and then to select the optimal doses end of the trial. Okay, so the here. So we, ha so we have three different doses, right? And how to choose the best dose? Which one is best? Okay, so that is a question, right? So how to choose the, uh, I mean, how to choose the optimal dose? Some criteria, right? So here, like, let me uh, introduce this only followed in cohort, right? So we follow patient for one year or for 100 days, but like we evaluate the uh, the optimality of dose at the end of the 30 days and the 100 days. Okay, so for the cytokine storm at 100 days. And the 30 days, and for the other outcomes, like four, like 100 days. And so, like at the end of this only follow up, either occurs or no occurs, right? So, you have here the delta sub j prime, so that is either one observed, zero not observed. So, then, like you have uh, this delta, I mean, it's hard to see, but like it's in the gold, so it's a uh, Five dimensional binary vector, so either either zero or one, right? So for the, each of the outcomes, and then we have 24 possible outcomes because of the competing resistance. Okay, and then the here we're giving numerical values for the, uh, for the each of the 24 outcomes. 
So worst outcome gets a small value. Good outcomes will get like a bigger value. Okay, so if a person dies, okay, so then like we keep a zero. Okay, they have to survive to get better number. And then, and then we give, we assign the numerical values to each event and for this. And so like this is like, a, I mean, the way that would be done and then the period did as well in the, in his previous work. And so here's an example. So we have, if the death occurs, then we give a zero, right? If death does not occur, then we give some numbers. Okay, so large number means a better outcome. Small number means just a small outcome. Okay, and then like if we assign that, and then let me see. So here we have so the delta probability to the delta is a probability for a sub a subspace of y, right? So so uh, so uh, the delta corresponds to a specific subspace of y. Right? So then like since we have a joint distribution over y, we can find the joint distribution of this delta prime. Alright? So the given we have a joint distribution that depends on my dose and then prognostic factor and the parameter. Right? So given parameter, we can take the expectation, so the expected utility for that I mean like a for the treatment. Like of giving dose D to a patient having the prognostic factor Z, right? So Bayesian data is random, all right? Okay, so then like we, we have here like D, uh, D sub N max that is a full data set after finishing uh, after finishing a trial, and so like we are making a decision for the future patient, which means predicting distribution. Right? So posterior predictive distribution. So we are using the predictive uh, posterior predictive mean utility. So here's the utility, right? So we have posterior distribution, and then we integrate our data so get so that we get the predictive distribution, right? So then we we will choose. So for each z, we have for each d, we have posterior expected utility, and then you, we choose the dose having the maximum mean of posterior predictive utility. That's going to be our optimal dose. No, yes, so uh, I remember that you at the beginning with describing this as adaptive biopsy, and you change the randomization to those is uh, like the interim uh, steps, or we just do the evaluation at the end? So the evaluation dose selection is a only once. At the end of the trial, and then the, during the trial, we're gonna do like some adaptive uh, the decision, <coughs> and so that is coming to the same point. So let's see here. So like uh, during the trial, we am I, oh, I think I'm a little behind. So let me speed up. <laughs> okay. So the so safety monitoring during the trial, we identify unsafe doses, right? So here's the probability of uh, death within the only follow-up period, right, for the give, giving dose B and for the patients in C and the given theta. And then if this is, so like this probability is greater than this upper limit, upper limit is pre-specified by clinicians, and then this is a tuning parameter, and if this one is uh, satisfied, then we say that like, dose D is unsafe. And the distributed parameter, again, like we did extra simulations and then try to find a good value, giving us a good operating characteristics. And here's the action space. So here's some like a sequential adaptive thing. So the A, so the action space, so we can take an action. So that is a space for action, made from your Bayesian analysis course, right? So you have action space, zero, no treatment, and the doses one to three. Okay, so these are the set of your actions. And uh, when we have a small but like enough data to start uh, the safety monitoring, then we do safety monitoring and then we modify our action space. For like each subtype, I know, each, what, what is this? 
problematic subgroup, and then it is a, a function of data as well, right? As data, um, as more data comes, your A will change. And since it is a function of a Z, and if Z is a different, they will be different. And then if this A contains only zero, then like we do not treat any patients in this cell. And if this A contains zero for all Z, then like there is no safe dose for no uh, subgroup, we have to turn this in the uh, before getting into the, the, the end of the trial. Okay, so, so that fifth, so here, on other side, let me skip this, but like there was some additional rule insisted by NCI, the National Cancer Institute, and so we have some stupid rule there, but like, let, me skip, <laughs> let me skip it, uh, because it ignores Z, and then it looks at like those levels, uh, those one only. Okay, but let me, so trial conduct, okay, aha. Uh -huh. So I'm a little bit already. Okay, so, but that's usually, but okay, so let me see. So we did uh, like a block randomization within the disease type. So here the disease type, one, two, three, we randomly commuted the doses. So here is like, a, it happened to be like a two, one, three, one, three, two, three, one, two, like, like that. And so here's the three patients in cohort one, and then they have like a, there's a covariate. So like uh, the first patient has uh, uh, disease type two, and then the other is uh, three. So since it, uh, uh, the patient one has disease type two, so I go to the second row, and then the, I treat, uh, I assign patient one to close to one. And then the patient two has disease type three, so I go there, and then I treat uh, patient two at close two. And then go to the uh, and then assign the patient three to the next available one, and so it's a uh, one. So it is like this. So you cross out the used uh, the doses, and then you assign them to the those doses. Okay, it is a before doing uh, the safety monitoring. After starting the safety monitoring, we have two tables. So these are the tables for the uses posted. And then these are for the acceptable, uh, the exit, same exit. So say like we have these uh, new cohort, and so Z, that is a zero 03, and so let's go to Z, zero 03. And then all three doses are unsafe, then we shouldn't treat the patient. And then here, so here's a one and one, uh, one, one, so one and one, so we know that like, the doses one and three are safe, and those two is unsafe. Right, so I go there, like they have this is type one, so go there, and so one I can use, it's unused, so I can uh, assign this patient to here, and then two I have to skip because it's unsafe, and then here I, then like the next available one is a three, so I give those three to this patient, so like in this way. So like no treatment, and then this one, and so, like that's how the trial was conducted. Okay, so that I already talked about at the end of the trial, we selected the max of uh, the, the dose. And then I, we have some simulation scenarios, and uh, let me speed up. So we have some simulation scenarios. This one is like we are simulating the, uh, the data from uh, a model, which I mean like it, it doesn't assume like any regression model. I just uh, use the probabilities uh, provided by the KD, and then I used, the, we still used the Weibull, and but like he doesn't assume the regression of uh, the relationship. And for the other ones, I, I used something similar to the assumed model, but it is more general because it's, uh, the C has a J indexed by JRD. In our case, it was only J. And then this beta also indexed by JRD, but ours was uh, the J only. So it is more general, but like it's it's different from our assumed model, but like not a lot, but still a little bit different. Okay, so evaluated uh, under two criteria. So P stop. So that is how often we identify a dose as an unsafe. Okay, so if this is big for truly unsafe dose, we are good. 
And if this is a small for truly safe notes, we are good. All right? And then the next one is how often we choose a dose as the best dose. Okay, so if this number is good, uh, is big for truly optimal dose, we're good. And if this number is small for not truly optimal dose, then we are good. Do you notice that I'm speaking of talking about that? But please stop me if uh, uh, you, you get confused. Can I actually just clarification? So you have your different mean models. Every, everything is under the Weibull model, correct? Yes. Uh, but I will address something for Boston later. Okay. And so here, uh, so this one, like uh, it's not from our, I mean, no uh, relationship, the regression relationship. It is equally good, like all doses are equally good. And so let me hear it. So it's a better and a minute to explain what it is. So this table is so easy. So let me explain. So we have a six different prognostic factors, right? So we have these six blocks, right? And so this one, low bulk disease, high bulk disease, and the CLL, ALL, and HN, okay? And then each, the first row, so that is true probability of death, okay? And then this one is a limit. If this true probability is greater than this limit, then it is unsafe, truly unsafe. And then this one is true expected of uh, the utility. High is better. And as you can see here, like no one is uh, unsafe. And then they uh, doses have the same utility, so they are equally good. Okay. And so p stop is pretty small, right? So it it doesn't identify like any dose as unsafe with a high probability, which is good. And then the P-cell, like the number of times, the proportions, uh, that like okay, how much we select or dose as the optimal. As you can see, like it is close to one third. And although like it's a, you see like a something, I mean, sometimes it gets big, right? This one is big and this one is small. But like since we, this one, we didn't simulate the data from our assumed model which has Regression, uh, regression relationship, and so like it looks uh, good at uh, for this case. And then for this one, okay, so it doesn't show that much color, but like these color ones, the gray color ones, they are unsafe. And then like underlined one, like they are the optimal doses. It's a really, really easy problem because if we, when it is unsafe, it is a really big number. And then also, like if it is optimal, then like the expected to expect the utility is so high. But however, in this case, if we ignore the uh, prognostic factor, I mean like we we screw, we get screwed, right? So like that's it. because of the optimal doses changes across the different subtypes, and then we do pretty well, right? And so like that's it. And then we have like everything is unsafe, and then like we stopped the trial a lot uh, before getting to the last patient. And then here, like a, I mean, like a doses, like optimal doses changes of, I mean, like across, I mean, across this uh, LBD and HDD, and then we were so very fine. As you can see, like if uh, this dose, uh, this true death probability. It is slightly bigger than like this limit. Then like our method doesn't I mean, identify it with a high probability. It's a very I mean, small, but, uh, but that is because they are so close. Okay, so we have more scenarios, and uh, okay, let me skip a little bit. So, okay, so we okay, so like it makes a. I mean, like a patterns well, and then makes the correct decisions. I mean, under the assumed scenarios, and then, and then also like I didn't talk about that like in the, uh, the in the uh, I mean the three uh, the previous slides, but like in a trial, if we identify unsafe dose correctly, we do not assign patients to like the uh, the, the unsafe dose. 
right? So which means very ethical, right? So we looked at I mean, which doses the patients were assigned to, and then we, uh, we observed that like our design uh, in pay, uh, assigns like a fewer patients to onset doses during a trial, which is a matter. Okay, so uh, we compared the, a simpler version of design ignoring the subgroup effect, and so like we identify like uh, we identify truly safe dose and uh, safe dose with a higher probability, and then we identify the truly unsafe dose with a higher probability as well, and then the, the optimal dose selection we do uh, we do better. Sorry that I did not spend that much time to, to give a full explanation here. And so here are the robustness. Okay, so we simulated the, the Ys from Y distribution, which is assumed the model, right? So what if Y doesn't come from Y distribution? So we simulated Y from like the uh, uh, Logistic, the log logistic distribution or the log normal distribution. It's a still a parami uh, par uh, parametric models, but it allows different shapes for hazard function. It allows it like a bathtub or <laughs> this pump shape, pump shape, and so like it's a different. But it works. Uh, I mean, again, like <coughs> our primary goal is not to estimate the response curve accurate. Our primary goal is to give a reliable decision procedure, decision making procedure. In terms of that, it works fine. Okay, so the, okay, the one more minute. <laughs> Good, let me speed up, really, like it's almost the end, okay? Uh, so like we increase the sample size, we have a 60, but we increase up to 120, so like this uh, performance works much better, so it has an implication that if it is possible, it's better to have more patients. It's uh, more crucial when you have a sub -dose. And then the uh, shorter follow-up, and so like we, this is our original follow-up. What if we follow the uh, patients for the short amount of, uh, amount of time? Then like the, the performance becomes worse, and then greatly, really, it's a, it's a greatly. And so it's better to follow patients for a longer period of time. Okay, so here, yeah, like, I mean, I mean, you know already, right? So we developed the clinical trial design, and then we accounted for the patient heterogeneity, uh, specified by prognostic factors. And then here, that, okay, so if the sum of outcomes hazards are known to increase with the dose, if monotonousity or the, some kind of a shape is known, then like it could be you know, like incorporated. It should be incorporated. And then the block randomization, which we used, it could be uh, replaced by some other adaptive within subgroup dose assignment procedures using expected utility. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. some traumatic event, you're going to start stepping down very quickly because that's really where your information is coming from in the events, right? Okay, uh, I mean, if uh, I, I mean, like, I, I mean, first I should admit my ignorance in biology and medical area, but like for the, uh, for other the drugs, I mean, we have some extra, uh, the rule, like uh, not skipping any untried doses, so you are like moving up along the dose like they sequentially, and however, like that assumption is not reasonable the, from the, uh, the conversation with Katie, so that's why we did the like, block randomization instead of like a going, I mean, going up like a dose in a sequential way. Okay, 
so like for other works, uh, I mean, we did that. Like we goofed off and then like we did the randomization, like among the tried ones and moving off one at a time. And, but like that, and I, mean, I was told that it's not, that, that, may be, uh, that may not be reasonable for this uh, immuno, the NK cell based immunotherapy, and that's why we didn't do it. So, so they believe it's ethical to just begin patients when you don't know what's going on at the highest dose of your That's what that's what so, I, so I, when you evaluate the trials, then normally one of the ways that we evaluate the trials is kind of the probability of targeting the correct dose versus the average number of PLTs or, or the literature events that we observe in the trial, right? So you obviously run the risk when you start ranking people up very early on at the highest dose of having a large number of observed PLTs. And again, that's where you're getting information. So I understand that helps this work. But did you look at, say, what your versus a, a standard, say, CRN type of model or just a DLT, single outcome, and how many DLTs you would observe if you just ramped people up versus your method where you're kind of starting them off at high doses and then bringing them back down? Uh, we, we didn't try. Uh, we haven't tried that one because, you know, again, like I think we are hitting the same point. And since we didn't assume the molecular state, and we, also, I mean, we, we think maybe toxicity occurs with a higher probability at low dose. And so like, that's why like, we didn't try the CRN type of uh, like, I mean, like, the method to our work. No, I understand, but I mean, this is all simulation, right? Yes, so, I mean, it's always simulation. Right? I mean, it's yes, not, yes. You know, we're not experimenting with Right, yes, but hopefully like, it's, it's used. I mean, like, I, I think I'm not giving you sufficient answers, <laughs> but hopefully, like I clarified a little bit. <coughs> so, um, other questions? So, well, first, I wanted to say, well, thanks for doing. We don't usually see this, but uh, actually, you know, these are somehow trials get uh, uh, planned, organized uh, in real life, which is what we do in the end. Uh, we actually plan to run this trial later on. So. Um, so this is everything that needs to be uh, considered, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that I don't regard and maybe always uh, um, worried about, uh, you know, vision adaptive clinical trials, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that, but uh, um, so you have not many patients, right? Uh -huh. And you're doing all these uh, complicated uh, uh, adaptation of the mm -hmm. right? Um, and eventually, basically, basing these uh, your decisions on the data average, right? Um, of, of different uh, uh, trials, right, right. trials. Right, So we are evaluating how, yeah, how is uh, the uncertainty uh, of uh, the decision yeah. assessed? Yeah, like uh, in the end, so like what we do is we choose one dose, right? So we do, do, uh, we do not account for like uncertainty and like a compound. Yes. Uh, I mean, like that's contained in your posterior distribution, but usually we give just a one dose, and, right? Yes, yes, but I mean, you have all these parameters, right? And you have all these trials, right? And so the thing that I, I, I don't know how to say this in a different way, but you know, uh, let's say for eventually you basically choose the, either the mode, uh -huh. uh, yes, the I, mean, those, I mean, consider. If uh, we want to be comprehensive, we can say like dose one could be optimal, uh, optimal dose with the probability something, and dose two is uh, optimal with the posterior probability something, and like that's something that we can, I mean like that's a one way to enjoy our posterior distribution. But like in the- at the end, does it consider the trajectory is just the final? Yes, it's just a final. So in the end, you have one posterior, the most updated posterior issue. Other questions? Questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you.